Dear colleagues, good day, good afternoon. We are about to uh, launch our roundtable called The Black Mirror. Law versus ethics, the ethics of AI. We're hosting this discussion in the framework of the International Forum for Legal and Ethics Issues of AI Integration. And of course, all of this is a part of our large-scale blanket conference called AI Journey. Within this round table, we're going to be discussing the issues that, of course, are of great importance. This is something that we deeply care about, something that is bothering us. How we're going to regulate this coexistence of human intelligence and AI, which will, which will be the norms and laws that will regulate that. Should we change that? Should we adapt to that? And let me introduce our speakers, Tatiana Matveeva, the head of the the, the head of the administration of the President of the Russian Federation, Aksana Tarasenko, the Deputy Minister for Economic Development of the Russian Federation, Mr. Oleg Kachanov, the Deputy Minister for Digital Development uh, and Communications of the Russian Federation, Alexander Kuleshov, the Rector of the Skolkovo University of Tech, and also the Chairman of the uh, Commission for AI and Ethics, Alexander Krainov, in charge of the computer vision services from Yandex, and Andrei Neznamov, the CEO of Data Research Center of Sberbank, representing Sberbank, obviously, today. And I will be moderating the talk. Let me just, before we start, say a few things. Let me put you in the context of our encounter today before I start asking questions. So. I know that we are moving now into this unique format of communications of presidents. The questions asked, the issues raised were all connected to the subject of how together we can coexist with machines. Can AI rule the country? Can AI manage the company and be the CEO? And therefore, what kind of limitations are we facing? How can we further develop the subject of data and AI? How should we make decisions based on AI recommendations? And where's this thin line that separates good from bad, positive from negative, good from evil? And whether the scenarios and the plot that we see in the TV series called The Black Mirror, which is sort of, sort of an anti-utopian, futuristic TV series, mostly showing the negative consequences of technology. So the question is whether those scenarios are truly realistic. Will they ever come to life? The forum that we have been hosting for two days now is of course covering the broad range of subjects. But this particular round table, hopefully, will be able to raise uh, the issues that will bring some clarity into this matter of AI regulation. We'll have lots of speakers from the Council of Europe, from the Security Council as well. We shall have the AI minister from Arab Emirates. So the first question I'd like to ask to Tatiana Matveeva about the culture of digital society. Many people say that there is always a drawback to, contempt, to modern technologies and that they always backfire. So when social laws change, the society changes. We um, arrive to a mix of ordinary society and digital society. And uh, not so many people would definitely prefer to live in this digital society. So we all arrive to the sort of culture of coexistence, culture that combines these things together. So this year we're living in this new era of uh, huge volumes of digital communications in this new digital landscape. So in the future, can we influence that? through actual legal regulation. What's your opinion about that? 
Dear colleagues, thank you so much for the question. I believe that Vladimir, it's, it's not fully correct to speak about the digital society. Society is always human society by nature. But as a result of technological integration, the interaction in society changes, cultural interaction changes, cultural landscape changes, but the laws of society are still human laws of society. And they're all founded by human values. They're based on human values. So the question is whether people, whether human beings are willing to sacrifice their privacy and freedom for the sake of um, new technologies and technological progress. And I think it's mostly appropriate to start broader social discourse about that, about Russian citizens, with Russian citizens as well. And that is happening in many other countries as well. And I'm very happy that in our country next year, in the framework of the federal project for AI, we're going to host civic discussions about AI and its policies. On the one hand, at the forum, at the forums and civic discussions, we'll be communicating practical values of AI, as it's been said many times today at the main session dedicating, dedicated to strategic issues. But we will also communicate the risks of AI integration. Integration. On the other hand, the research community, the academic community, uh, the public community will get a feedback from the citizens about um, what's their perception of the AI. We'll be talking to those who will be actually hands-on applying AI and those who will be affected by that application. So our mission is not to deeply and strictly regulate technology. We don't want to, we don't want to hinder the, the development of technology, but we want to find this threshold where technology is no more ethical, no more secure, and we should never cross that threshold. And that's the only way to get civic trust and provide that long-term interest of Russian society will be um, actually taken into consideration. And of course, technology should be ethical. And that's becoming another benchmark for product access in Russian market and in international markets as well. So if we want to take leading positions in AI regulation and development, of course we should participate in the global process of uh, development of rules and regulations, including ethic rules and regulations, ethical rules and regulations. Uh, the president of Sberbank has been saying about that today, uh, clearly stating that AI should serve humanity, calling to professional community to embrace ethical values in technologies. I know that there are ideas about uh, uh, fleshing out the code with these ideas, and I hope that in 2021 we're going to be able to work productively and fruitfully in this area. and. Uh, fulfill the tasks of the president and hopefully we're going to get the code of ethics on AI. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Matveyeva. I wanted to point out that it is very important to remember that we need to find a consensus regarding what is uh, ethical and responsible AI. And in that sense, I wanted to ask you, Ms. Tarasenko, you are in charge of uh, AI development issues in general, all the way from uh, the level of the government uh, and downwards. So what is the responsibility of the state as far as uh, our future goes? What is the role of the state? Um, here in uh, in the judicial, in the executive branch, with regard to AI, and today we heard this news that in the United States they adopted the Code of Ethics for government agencies and bodies uh, in the area of AI, with the view to explaining to the society how the technology is uh, designed. And what is your thinking about this? Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues, uh, participants of our today's session, uh, watchers and viewers. First of all, I wanted to thank the SBER team for the organization of this uh, forum. The plenary session was very interesting, very effective, and uh, we saw that new tracks were identified in the area of AI development. And uh, similar to last year, 
The importance of AI development was underscored by our president, who took part in the plenary session of the forum. Here's what I wanted to say about this. Of course, the state does pay attention to these issues, because AI is uh, already part of our lives. We may uh, turn a blind eye to this. We can disregard this. But we have our assistants. We have uh, those digital helpers that uh, very soon will start uh, arguing with us. Uh, and uh, maybe in the near future, we'll be able to use more of those uh, driverless cars. And of course, the issues of ethics are very important in that regard. And uh, the harmonical implementation of AI into our lives is what uh, is regarded by the state as a priority number one. But as uh, Tatiana said, it is important to find the right balance, the optimal balance. And we need to, uh, you know, tap the experience of our foreign colleagues and not make their mistakes. And uh, the United States is choosing one track. The uh, European Union is uh, paying more attention to the human uh, dimension, and China is uh, taking a third track yet. And uh, we all are thinking whether we want to go that far as far as the human dimension goes. Well, we need to find the right balance. We need to protect the security of the person, the rights of the person, and the uh, communities in general from any negative impact of the AI. But at the same time, we will allow the AI to develop and move on. Today, Mr. Putin made an interesting analogy uh, with a child. Uh, it's still in its infancy, AI, that is, and uh, it will still need to learn. It will need to go to school and uh, mature. But we need to understand at the same time that AI is a technology for data processing. And as humans, and as the representative of the state, we are in charge. We lead the way for this technology. This is just a very advanced technology, and it wouldn't be proper to think about the ethics of this only from the humanitarian point of view. We've already started making some inroads into this field. We are developing standards, and we have started uh, developing regulations. And uh, that's been alluded to by Mr. Putin. We are beginning to set up uh, research centers. We would want to see one uh, such center focusing on ethics, because we believe that uh, basic sciences are going to be quite useful here whenever we interact with our foreign partners, because the issue of ethical standards is a topic number one that is widely discussed at various international fora. And here, the Russian Federation needs to play a very active role in this, and therefore our work is going to be focusing on uh, domestic regulations. And of course, we'll be focusing on international rules and practices. Another important uh, step here would be to ensure that uh, this is the technology that is trusted by people. We would need to raise their awareness. And we have a federal project that is going to be um, geared towards that. We're going to have a ethical forum or ethics forum, rather, next year. It's going to become a, an annual event. We want to have a full-fledged debate about this topic there, and we want to uh, sync our efforts with the business community. And uh, uh, to sum up my uh, speech, I wanted to dwell on these uh, principles. Uh, it's the principle of uh, voluntariness, first of all, because we've been using AI uh, without even noticing that just recently. Uh, I had to uh, be or ride in a driverless car just uh, because that was uh, something I had to do as part of my job. And I had uh, mixed feelings. It was something unexpected. And at the same time, I, uh, I was quite confident in that technology. We drove around as size and then we went to the city. But later on, this will be something that people will have to do on their own. And people will have to choose whether to use the AI or not. The other principle, which is quite important, is that algorithms need to be transparent and uh, really readily understandable. And uh, the national strategy that is being developed uh, is uh, describing one of the rules. Um, this is one of those rules. 
It is important to ensure that the state is uh, maintaining its sovereignty whenever these technologies are implemented. It's very important for us to maintain our dialogue with international colleagues, and the state will have to develop these technologies to improve uh, the uh, livelihoods and well-being of its citizens, primarily in the area of healthcare and well-being. And at the same time, we need to understand that AI will free us from uh, routine work and will reduce the risk of uh, contingent events, uh, negative events, and will optimize our expenses and free up our time. And one of the principles, uh, maybe the final one, is that in our opinion, AI can be implemented uh, in a phased manner. So we can you know, weigh our next step and then implement those uh, capabilities that are well advanced. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Tarasenko. And uh, in that regard, what is your thinking? Or maybe I should uh, direct this question to Oleg Kachanov because he is one of those people who makes decisions on this topic. AI is about making decisions. And whenever we talk about AI, we say that uh, when we make decisions, AI helps us make those decisions, be that uh, uh, a case when you're an expert or a bureaucrat. Uh, and right now, we don't see the right balance where we can um, allow technologies to play a more active role in this. What is your thinking about this? On the one hand, you are part of the Ministry for Digital Technologies, and you are implementing uh, AI as part of your job. Uh, at the same time, we have a major program on implementing AI uh, in all of government agencies, and you are there at the forefront of this effort. What is uh, your thinking about how this can be regulated at the government level, if it is uh, something that is at all possible? Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, I will uh, piggyback on uh, what Mr. Senko said earlier. I totally agree with everything that has been said. I uh, simply wanted to uh, you know, make a bridge between regulation and all of the other decision-making processes. Uh, of course, uh, regulation is something that we uh, look at. We need to understand how AI is going to be interacting with the humans when decisions are being made. Uh, it is indeed true that AI is about uh, data processing. Mr. Kalchanov, uh, we cannot really hear you. Can you speak a little bit louder? Is this better? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. So. Uh, everything that is related to uh, legal constructs uh, and uh, definitions, uh, this is something that we'll uh, leave aside for, for the moment. Let's go back to the principles, the principle of uh, voluntariness and uh, um, awareness. These are the principles that underpin the well-being and security of people. And this is something that needs to be addressed in the laws and regulations, and that the AI should be used for these purposes. And of course, no harm can be inflicted by AI. This is one of those roles of robotics. We have never uh, evolved from those roles, uh, rules that were developed many decades ago. And any decisions that we make with AI, they have to be under human control, not the other way around. It is important that we embed uh, the principle of avoiding manipulation of humans. And we understand that with AI, it's pretty easy to do if you really wanted to. And so these are the principles that are the principles underpinning our regulatory work. Speaking about decision making per se, I'd like to say that this is one of the key challenges that we'll have to address. And we'll have to address that uh, both from the standpoint of ethics and from the legal standpoint. We need to make sure that we always understand who is responsible for making decisions using AI. AI today is an assistant in making your decisions. Uh, it's providing you hints. But we are the ones that ultimately are responsible for making the decision. Humans make decisions. AI will make decisions where this is not associated with uh, direct legal consequences for humans, or it's not going to affect uh, in a negative way the well-being of people whenever there is this possibility. It's very important in the business communities. It's important in the public administration. And uh, once again, the key point is that the human should always 
bear the final responsibility for making the decision. AI will be a helper, a uh, hinter, um, a forecaster, but never the decision maker in the strict sense of the word. And this is indeed a major theoretical problem, a legal problem. We haven't yet found the right answer to that. We'll still have to research this further and experiment without you know, crossing that fine line that um, Tatiana spoke about at the very beginning of this uh, section. If we understand that, uh, let's say, a business community has a model uh, that is based on uh, AI algorithms that are well developed and 97% of clients are quite happy with it. But then 3% are affected by the disruptions in the system and they do not get the services. And uh, let's extrapolate this to public administration. That means that 3% of our citizens will not have their rights upheld. And who's going to be responsible for that? Is it going to be AI or the developers of AI or the agency that is going to be uh, held responsible for this? This is a legal, ethical, uh, and otherwise uh, important issue that will have to be reflected in the regulations and laws. We need to clearly describe uh, what and who is responsible for using AI for various purposes and applications, including case law. At the same time, we need uh, certain uh, rules for uh, fixing errors, because AI is not perfect, uh, nor is uh, a human being. And so we would need to be uh, able to have a mechanism to fix errors that uh, the AI has committed, and therefore AI does have uh, a place in uh, public administration. It helps reduce your costs. It uh, frees you up from routine. Uh, it uh, crashes corruption. At the same time, um, we can hope that it will uh, continue evolving. And nevertheless, there will always be a point where we will be able to fix a mistake if we are going to be able to uh, see that the mistake has been made. Though These are the key points I wanted to make. Vladimir, back to you. Thank you very much. Alexander, uh, we are already having a heated debate on this topic. Um, what is your position on this topic as someone who is in charge of Russia's Committee on Ethics at the uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs Committee on UNESCO Affairs? We together participated in the review of this major document that was developed where they put together all of the key uh, UNESCO principles that UNESCO is working on right now. What is the reason for uh, these issues becoming so, so relevant, uh, especially over the last several years? What is your attitude uh, towards this document and this topic in general? Thank you very much. Uh, you know, instead of uh, answering this question in an abstract way, I will give you a specific example. Just recently, as we all know, uh, Fakhrizadeh, uh, the Iranian top nuclear scientist, was uh, assassinated. Uh, cannot uh, be sure, but I heard from different sources that the, there will be, there, there were points that would uh, point at his assassination taking place. There were. Uh, cars around where he was killed. So there were web cameras around where the explosion took place. And there was a pickup truck uh, and there was uh, a, a machine gun on that pickup, the pickup truck and uh, the machine gun fired at the car. And that is a classical example of using the AI. And um, Alexander Andrei Niznamov is here, and he knows that if you have the video data, um, you can make uh, such a system work. This is a, an excellent example of uh, how AI uh, could, uh, could be used for very uh, bad purposes. I mean, it was done in a street where there were very few people involved. And uh, that is where AI is used at the technical level. as. Uh, uh, part of my life, I spent uh, my youth and the younger years, I uh, you know, worked at the strategic level. And uh, I can tell you that when you use uh, AI for expediting decision making, uh, in terms of using the red button figuratively, that's very dangerous because AI does contain a lot of hazards and risks. If it is implemented in one country, it will make other countries to implement it as well. 
and uh, uh, you know this uh, uh, this hand on the dial of nuclear apocalypse is going to approach the noon number. But the general idea of UNESCO, speaking about that, is about creating the uh, analog organization of uh, IAA, something that uh, was uh, developed in the 50s and the 60s to prevent the spread of the nuclear weapons. Can we do it now? My answer is probably not, because the IAA was created at the time when there were two states that were equals and they were interested in non-proliferation. Well, we are still uh, Oh, are we still uh, members of this club? Uh, just last week, the Stanford University published uh, the list of top 2% in all uh, areas of science. Uh, let's take a look at AI, although this is not considered to be science, but let's take a look at it anyway. Out of 4.5 thousand scientists and researchers in this list, uh, only nine of them work in Russia. Out of those, uh, Tchaikovsky, Professor Tchaikovsky is, is in 129th place, and then at uh, position 771, a uh, representative of uh, St. Petersburg uh, Polytechnic University. So 4,500 scientists, and only nine of them are from Russia. I think that reflects very clearly where we stand with the development of AI in Russia. Yes, Trump did issue an uh, executive order about AI a very important a milestone for the United States. But we shouldn't be forgetting that there is also China there. And um, I'm sure that the uh, race um, with the United States uh, is going to be uh, uh, lost because China has a huge database and they know how to centralize it. This could be our major advantages, one of our advantages. And uh, it is. Uh, uh, commonly said that data is the new oil. It is true, but sometimes this is misconstrued to mean that, uh, I mean, we have a lot of data and therefore we are rich. Well, we do have data, but this data is uh, not structured, and not structured. Uh, sometimes it's on paper. Now, there's a lot of noise in the data, so you need to have tools that would allow you to extract uh, proper information out of the data so that you can create the data sets that will be usable by AI algorithms and machine learning tools. And that is why uh, there are certain things that can be done about this. This uh, uh, makes me think, why were we successful uh, in our missile project and uh, with our nuclear uh, project and we didn't succeed with electronics well uh, because our elderly leaders in the Soviet Union they did quite understand what we're going to use the electronics for what are we going to calculate with those computers if we repeat those mistakes now our future is not going to something that will be envied by others so therefore we need to be uh, aware exactly where we are we are at the very bottom uh, right now there's an official uh, uh, table, and we are somewhere between Saudi Arabia and uh, Poland in uh, position number 34. So nine people out of 4,500. And uh, that we are in number 33 place, that's not really that bad, but the number of scientists is really speaking volumes. So what can we do? We would never have enough effort to catch up with the US or China. We need to actually define strategic pathways where we should not, must not fall behind and concentrate on them. Not AI as a whole. We shall not be able to maintain parity with the US and China in AI, but we should define the areas where we should never ever fall back. Uh, the AI should not be prejudiced, should not be biased. That's the official term, the bias of AI. Obviously, if we train AI based on human data, this, this AI absorbs the prejudice of that data, the uh, values, the beliefs of that data, and that can create the AI models that are biased. There's been the scandal recently that AI has been blamed uh, to be racist because with two similar features for black and white person with the same age, same weight, same condition, the AI suggests different tracks for treatment in a hospital. 
but AI understands statistically certain correlations that human beings do not see. The black people they eat food of lower quality. They don't have uh, so they don't have bio biochemistry of the same level. So ethics is not about technology. Ethics is about application of technology. Ethics is about um, the application of technology that is malevolent. Fortunately, in Russia, we're still able to concentrate data, put it into packages. Modern days, ML models need the data to be collected, aggregated. There's, of course, federative ML when we can get data from one batch, from another batch, from a third batch. But ML is much more efficient when data is, in, is all together. Maybe tomorrow it will be different, but that's what we have today. All of the data must be in one batch. And China, with its centralization system, naturally has better advantage. Today, everybody understands that the AI race can be won not only thanks to the talent that works in your company or in your country, but first and foremost, thanks to the volume of the data and quality of its aggregation, because that data is used to train the model, not the data that is scattered in Russian railways or Gazprom or any other company. No, the data should be aggregated in a specific way. There is one company in the world called Palantir Technologies. It has been founded by CIA and FBI and Agency for National Security. Uh, now it's a civil company. Now they have this beautiful product called Gotham. I've seen it used once in Airbus. Alexander, I'm very sorry for interrupting. It's just timing, timing. Please, we are, we have to be on schedule. Thank you so much. Based on what you've said, I'd like to comment this. We need volumes of data, large volumes of data. Obviously. Alexander, then the question. It's clear that we need large volumes of aggregated data, but Alexander uh, Krainov mentioned the idea that we are taking the, we're occupying the 33rd position in science and research in the world. Is that the reflection of reality? Yes, a notion. AI is not physics. It's not math. AI is not about science. Everything's been published is hands-on solution, is a range of hands-on solutions. So hands-on research is very, very well defined by that sort of um, indicators. Mr. Krainov was saying that the, his, his company is one of the top companies in hands-on research putting together top research and hands-on integration. So, Mr. Krainov, could you please comment this point? How do you see the situation? How does the Yandex uh, see that situation? Because you are kind of the developer. You are a software giant. Speaking about our level, here's what the situation looks like. The objective indicator that you should pay attention to that's one of the major KPIs for federal projects is the range of uh, white papers at top conferences, indeed. If you, what's a top conference? It's like, an, it's like the Olympic Games. You do not get, get there by paying money or by accident. Of course, the systems are never smooth, perfectly smooth, but still the system works. So the country that publishes more has better science, and has better research, R&D, hands-on science, hands-on R&D. But if we take a look at the range of countries, we can see that the situation in Russia is pretty disappointing. It's not that we're per se taking the 33rd position, but it's not top 10. And it's not about the position that Russia occupies, no. At the Sinel conference, Yandex was in the top five international companies uh, as far as the number of uh, white papers is concerned. That sounds great, but we are a commercial company. If we add universities to that, Russia is falling far behind. If we're looking at the Russian universities, it turns out that they have no white papers whatsoever. That is a, potentially is a catastrophe. And if we look at those who occupy positions 
uh, one, two, or three, those come plus Google, they are far, far ahead. It's specifically if we talk about the range of white papers. We are occupying some very weak position there, but we have good room to grow. If we take a look at the authors of white papers in the West, Western countries, we see many Russian names, which is true. So those who left Russia, and there are many people of high research degree who left Russia, which means that Russian educational system potentially can produce scientists and researchers of the top level. We have that. The only thing we have to do is to actually implement the framework, the conditions where those scientists will be able to work. As for data collection and overall the systems that work based on some real user data, I believe that here overall the situation is not that bad in Russia compared to other countries. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, we don't have uh, in Russia companies that collect data from all over the world. We don't have global giants in data collection and aggregation, but. There are, there are, there's only one country that actually does that, only the U.S. China, yes, but they are still mostly aggregating data from China, because Chinese services mostly work in China. We have seen uh, Chinese precedents, uh, Chinese apps, Chinese giants, tech giants that enter international markets, and we have recently seen uh, what happened to TikTok. But if we look at highly developed uh, country like France or UK or uh, Germany, the share of their services that collect data is actually significantly lower than in Russia. So we are not lost that way. Should not give up. Let me also look from a different angle at the situation. I want to agree with you. When we speak about the ethical issues, we need to bear in mind that we should be speaking about the ethics of AI application. No matter how perfect AI is, AI is a hammer. Hammer doesn't know ethics, but those who hold the hammer do have the ethics. Indeed, indeed, that's true. Thank you, Alexander. Andrei Nyaznamov. Taking into account the experience of your heading the working group in the in the Kahai. So, having worked with Kahai, uh, ad hoc committee on artificial intelligence. Um, What's your experience? I mean, how do they see this this issue of AI and AI regulation? Today we had the discussion with the presidents, and we talked about the balance between stimulating and regulating um, approaches. And again, we should bear in mind uh, human rights. Let me be brief, because I really do want to listen to my colleagues today. So, legal scholars and lawyers are not really looking at AI per se. I mean, if we talk about white papers uh, in Russia, recent white papers in Russia, you'll see everywhere a comment about legal issues of AI regulations and corresponding problems. But I see a trend there in academic environment. The main ideas arrive from abroad. There are some ideas uh, that seem to be original, having uh, they are published in, in Russian white papers, but more often than not, they have been previously published already somewhere in America or Europe or other Western magazines, issues, publications. So, if we look at what has been discussed uh, uh, in the Western world in robotic rule, we can definitely see what we are going to discuss in Russia in the upcoming year or two. Of course, not all of the, all of the problems that uh, were specifically timely and acute and, the West, and urgent in the Western world are applicable in Russia. The evidence shows that in spite of large-scale cultural 
paradigm in our society, for example, in Europe and America as well, uh, in terms of legal systems and the problems that are uh, coming to be in relation to AI, I'd say that Russia is pretty much the same. We are very similar to the Western uh, world. So, when AIs are speaking about AI, they're constantly pointing out to the issue of responsibility, of the one who should be blamed, who should be prosecuted when AI backfires or misjudges. By the way, legal systems of the US and Russia are like South and North Pole. They're radically different. Legal systems are different, but problems are the same. And it turns out that the solutions are the same as well. But in that, in that sense, I see that legal experts are now participating in the discussion of the most urgent matters. And 70-80% of the white papers are just really surface comments uh, about the rights of robotics, um, etc. But in Russia, we are seeing the range of colleagues, legal scholars, who are deeply immersed into the issues of AI. We had the first PhD in Russia actually granted, awarded last year and uh, two more this year in uh, AI regulation. And it's great that legal scholars are joining the board. For example, this uh, high commission that we have in Europe was actually preceded by five years of uh, work of legal scholars. White paper on AI regulation was specifically prepared based on the research that was hosted by 20 European universities in 2013. And that included many, many lawyers and faculties of law. So any paper, any law, any bill is always preceded by academic research, by the, uh, the, the research by legal scholars, by lawyers, philosophers, experts in economics. And that can only, that's the only way to produce some adequate uh, research result. Okay, thank you so much. Now we shall continue with the second part of our discussion, and I would like to remind uh, whom will be participating in that second part. Thank you, dear colleagues. I would like to ask a few questions to our new participants. And uh, if you're willing to respond, go ahead. But let us touch a few matters. First, how AI influences, affects uh, the life of our children. If we take a look at the future, if we actually look at the TV series about the future, uh, the overlook is always overly pessimistic. So, do you believe that uh, there's a ring of truth uh, in that pessimistic view? Will our children read this cultural code about negative, dystopian technological future? Will they absorb and embrace it? How shall we be living with that? What's the attitude? Uh, what's the what's the attitude of our children to the AI? What's the relationship between AI and our children when they're growing up in this new reality? They have voice speakers. They have voice assistants. They have wearable gadgets. So how will they perceive uh, AI tech, dear colleagues? Speaking about uh, how influence and robotics affects our lives, and particularly the life of our children, the lives of our children. Of course, it's um, an urgent matter, and the question broadly is, uh, what's the future for our children? What kind of future for our children we create today? And specifically, if we talk about bringing up an education, we are the first ones to make a direct effect on our children. It's we who introduces uh, these technologies in the lives of our children. 
So, we put those smart wristbands on the hands of our children. So now we should particularly focus on those areas where application of technology is mostly in demand on the one hand and on the other hand does not require certain moral choice and evaluation on more broad civic society's part. Speaking about AI in production so that we would minimize health risks, for example, we should be talking about analytical uh, services provided by AI. And those analytical services could, for example, give us emergency warning about natural or technical disasters. Now, AI is mostly used in marketing services, and that again brings up the issues of uh, data privacy. As the president said today, there is a lot of work to apply AI in agriculture, energy supply, utilities, healthcare. Those are the domains where data processing speed and therefore the velocity of decision making is of the utmost importance. That's where AI can make a difference. But I believe that technology should prove its worth and its security, as well as its practical value to civic society and to economy and public sector in general. And after that, we should proceed with integrating AI in different domains such as private life. And that will, of course, bring up lots of uh, legal tie-ins in relation to other constitutional rights of Russian citizens. So, I don't think that we have thoroughly enough, we have studied the consequences of uh, technology's implementations thoroughly enough. Uh, how technologies affect emotional and psychological state of uh, people. Let's talk about, for example, the startups that create digital twins of uh, famous personalities, such as actors, uh, singers, and other celebrities. Now we're talking about creating of uh, digital twins of your nearest and dearest who died. So it's not only the issue of ethics. This is the direct issue of psychological safety and health being for, because people will be literally talking to their loved ones who are already gone. Or the issue of talking to smart speakers. That's a different la layer of reality perception for some people. That requires more thorough psychological research. We should understand how that affects people. And uh, this is uh, definitely very important. Uh, you are saying that it's easy for children because they are well versed in technologies. And uh, it's uh, much uh, faster for them to figure out uh, what uh, uh, this gadget uh, does and how it works. And they get used to that much quicker. But at the same time, these technologies do impact uh, them uh, in a psychological way. And we don't know the extent of this impact. So uh, there are a lot of issues that need to be pondered and uh, addressed. And they are not easy. And to find the right answer to them, we need to be honest to ourselves and to the future generations. And we need to take weighted, well-weighted steps towards uh, uh, developing our society in a proper way to ensure that we will live to see the predictable consequences of what we do, although we know that uh, it is not possible to predict 100% what we're doing, but uh, at least some predictability would be good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tatiana. I was reminded by your speech of an example that I read about three years ago. There was uh, a murder in school in the United States. A uh, student uh, brought in uh, a gun into school and killed his uh, other fellow student. Uh, his parents. Uh, launched a major campaign, uh, including through their local representatives, uh, uh, trying to ban the use of uh, firearms. They didn't really succeed, uh, but uh, what they did, so they created a deep fake video showing the uh, killed student uh, talking, appealing to the residents of the state saying, well, I've been dead for three years and you haven't yet uh, dealt with this issue that would stop things from like this from recurring. Alexander, a question for you. I am confident that uh, your children are surrounded by uh, 
uh, drones uh, and uh, smart uh, speakers and other smart gadgets. And I'm sure they uh, they live in their smartphones. Is it really so? And how is this uh, really happening with you? I will start my answer with this. Uh, unfortunately, most of us mm, think about AI based on what we've seen in movies, because very few people are really uh, knowledgeable about what about what AI is about. And uh, we all heard about the laws of robotics, but uh, uh, that's probably the extent of it. Um, it's uh, similar to creating laws about what needs to be done in space if we were using Star Wars uh, franchise as the basis for our legislative action. And uh, essentially, when we talk about uh, space, we would not be dealing with uh, space uh, debris, but rather we would be thinking about how to build a Death Star, for example. And uh, uh, we wouldn't be forecasting using satellites. That is what is happening essentially with us with regard to, to AI, except for a few experts. It's very difficult to do something about this because of the misconceptions that exist. But with children, it's different because they have grown up in this environment. They talk to these digital assistants. And this is not something that is far-fetched. This is something they really understand well. They know their limitations. My children play a game uh, which uh, they uh, uh, like. It's Go. And uh, at one point, AI outplayed the human, the best human who played the game of Go. And for children, uh, they just regard this program as a coach, a trainer that allows them to advance in the game of Go. And they don't uh, look at it as something um, mystical. Uh, that is going to replace them tomorrow. They look at it in a different way. They will use it to calculate uh, a certain prediction that would uh, allow them to make the right move. So that means that they are very rational about their choices. And that is why I think uh, our children are going to be quite successful here. And uh, in the same way, we were able to figure out the internet, and now our parents and grandparents were able to figure out electricity. And I'm sure they're going to be fine. I mean, our children, they will much better understand the you know, thresholds of possible and impossible, the applicability of AI. They will feel the dangers of it much better than we do. And as it has always happened in the history, they're going to be uh, much smarter than we are in that area. I'm quite confident of that. Thank you very much for your optimistic view. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we have a consensus here in the audience regarding the principles of ethics and regulation. Is there an underlying principle that we could formulate and articulate and uh, know that it is supported, if not by everyone, but the majority of uh, our uh, panelists? Uh, security and AI, this is a very well-known uh, combination and Yandex colleagues, um, when they declared the Yandex principles, they said that the AI in Yandex uh, has to be safe and secure. But I know that uh, Alexander, uh, he will keep me honest uh, uh, if I say that the UNESCO principles uh, say that there is this principle of uh, safe and secure AI, saying that there has to be a black box built into the AI so that. Uh, we could use it to understand how a particular decision had been arrived at by that AI algorithm or system. So I would like you to speak about this, um, if you wish so, on this topic. Do we have a baseline principle that we can all formulate today and stick to and follow it? Oleg. How about you? Vladimir, to be honest with you, I'm uh, not uh, uh, ready to give up my principle, although it may sound lofty. It's more like uh, pipe dreams. 
and high-level understanding and uh, had never approached to dealing with specific issues. So I think the principle of responsibility of a human is the principle that we need to abide by, and it has to be um, enshrined somewhere. The second point I wanted to speak about, and uh, we've talked about this, and it is consistent with the Yandex principles, and that means that all uses of AI have to keep the well-being of the human at the forefront, uh, improvement of living standards, uh, improvement of uh, livelihoods is the priority. As soon as we start, you know, by stepping this, we will immediately start running into issues. And Mr. Kulishov and other Alexander spoke about when when you uh, have a uh, pilotless assassination uh, perpetrated by uh, AI. So two principles, the responsibility of a human, and secondly, any use of AI has to be improved at improving the livelihood of uh, humans and uh, enhancing security. They are very straightforward and um, they follow uh, just general rules of ethics uh, and uh, morals, if you will. Well, of course, we, we can argue about them, but we shouldn't be forgetting about this. Oleg, how about this? AI uh, is uh, not something predetermined. How can we deal with uh, this fact to ensure that these principles are upheld and followed and uh, understanding that these principles can be managed, but uh, we cannot really influence an un determinated uh, algorithm because we don't know how it is uh, operating. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I wonder if you've seen uh, this uh, uh, serial uh, called uh, Queen's Move or Queen's Gambit. So I understand that Gary Kasparov was one of the consultants uh, for that uh, series. And he said, in the past, we were taught that there is this strategy and this tactics and there is the theory of chess, but now children play with strong chess engines and they make stronger moves than the children that are using the traditional approach. They are making moves that they cannot explain the reasons for. What shall we do with that, Vladimir? I think a human being is uh, equally uh, unpredetermined, if you will, and uh, uh, therefore uh, it's just based on the practice of the individual, and uh, then you make decisions based on the practice you've had, on the experience you've had, and because this is not something that is based on algorithms, we need to uh, leave uh, ourselves uh, a certain point where the decision will be made by the human beings and not by the machine, uh, be that a service based on the uh, artificial intelligence or something else. There has to be a point where we know that we can roll things back. And uh, there has to be a set of rules that will determine uh, what we can do in this particular case because uh, mechanisms can make mistakes as well as humans can make mistakes, and we need accountability. I know that Alexander Krino wants to respond to this. How can a uh, unmanned aerial vehicle can uh, act in this particular case? Speaking about uh, UAVs, uh, I'd like to say a question arises whether an algorithm's decision can be uh, readily explainable. Any person working with algorithm uh, would say that uh, it's a separate task to make such algorithms and decisions uh, explainable. Uh, the system has to have certain limited uh, number of parameters. If you reduce the number of parameters in the system, you are reducing the accuracy. So we ne we'll always exchange the uh, explainability of the system for the accuracy of the system. Let's uh, say we have a system that uh, is explainable and it makes mistakes in 10% of cases. The system uh, that we look at as an alternative is more accurate. It only makes mistakes in 100 of the cases. Where would you go if you, for example, wanted to use this algorithm for medical purposes? Where would you want to get treated? I will vote for a system that makes less mistakes but unexplainable. And I believe our main metrics shouldn't be 
based on whether the system uh, can be explained, but rather it should be the accuracy of its operation, uh, aiming to work with the right data sets that will allow us to then test it. And if the system makes less frequently than a human being, I really don't care how well I can explain those decisions. If uh, the number of mistakes uh, is greater, then this is a problem. Thank you. Alexander, what do you think about this? We cannot hear you. Well, I uh, absolutely agree with uh, Alexander Krainov. We should forget about uh, being able to explain. I mean, because this is something that was the thing of the past in the 19th and the 20th century. In the 21st century, uh, it's going to be really harder and harder to explain things. AI and machine learning are about finding correlations that a human being cannot notice. So let me give you an example. All bankers in the world know that those who took a loan on Wednesday will uh, return it with a greater degree of probability than anyone who took it on a different day. It's impossible to explain, but the statistics uh, never lie. You also uh, have seen movies where the FBI is uh, accusing someone of uh, uh, a mistake. Uh, they can say, your balance sheet is, uh, is randomized. And that is not something that is possible, because if something is made by a human, uh, it cannot be randomized. There's a million things that you cannot really explain or understand, but they exist. And uh, we need to forget about being able to explain things. Uh, of course, you will go to a doctor who doesn't make mistakes, and you could care less about uh, uh, whether you can explain. Uh, you will not understand the explanations of the doctor to begin with. And it's not going to be really uh, of interest to you when uh, the algorithm cannot provide any explanations at all. Is my understanding correct that uh, the principle of transparency uh, of validation uh, and the mechanism, there is no principle of uh, transparency of validation. The practice is the criterion of uh, the truth, as we know. And the only test here would be the applicability in practice and uh, why we got a certain result. Alexander understands this perfectly well. Uh, it's as follows. In 90% of cases, there will be no explanation why certain things work and or doesn't work. Let's take deep learning. Jeffrey Hinton uh, invented it. And then uh, after six years of running with this idea, he finally won a contest. And then over the, the next eight years, those ideas were hyped up. And nobody could explain why deep learning works. And nobody can still to this date. I know a lot of mathematicians, serious mathematicians, that are working on that, but they haven't yet arrived at a constructive result. And I don't know whether they will ever. So explainability is something we should forget about. Thank you very much. That's a very uh, unexpected conclusion made uh, during this uh, discussion. Uh, let me move on to my next and final question. As you've heard from uh, mm, the uh, discussion attended by the president, uh, a lot has been said about ethics and regulation. And uh, we have uh, been uh, talking in front of uh, people that are not just regular people of our country, our citizens, or from other countries. Uh, it's, it's a question of what uh, they should be expecting, what shall they be doing? I'm talking about ordinary citizens. What shall they do with the subject of ethics, regulation, and principles of AI? Or shouldn't they do anything at all? Uh, there is nothing they can do. They shouldn't be doing anything. OK, thank you. Oleg, your turn. Ultimately, they need to enjoy it while they can. Uh, but seriously speaking, many are now concerned about uh, uh, learning about this more because they don't want to uh, lose the momentum. Uh, but my message with this follows. I don't uh, remember who it was who said this out of the two Alexanders present here. What is going to be now presented as AI will not contain science. It will be uh, just a set of use cases. Uh, and uh, if you are eager to learn, 
you would be learning about practical application of these solutions and not uh, uh, about learning the science behind uh, multiplication of matrices and uh, uh, linear algebraics. So you actually cannot uh, do without it. Well, but to move ahead with the community, with the society, you need to base your efforts on the use cases. And uh, somebody mentioned that 120 years ago, our uh, ancestors were able to uh, work with it somehow, uh, although some of them were skeptical uh, about the light bulb or electricity. But they were able to handle it. And uh, the practice that people have developed to be comfortable about this uh, is not because they learned the basics of physics, but because they learned to use uh, electricity in such a way so that you couldn't be electrocuted and uh, instead provide you with heat and would uh, turn your light on. These are very simple skills that allow you to understand where the limits of the technology use are and what are the risks that we, uh, we have. If you don't touch a uh, naked cable, you're not going to be electrocuted. So you don't need to idealize or demonize the technology. You just need to realize this is just the technology and you need to be able to use it properly. That's uh, my point. Okay, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, is there anyone who wants to speak about this topic? Tatiana, how about you? Yes, uh, thank you so much. I will support Oleg here. Uh, from uh, the standpoint of an ordinary person, you have to treat technology as that, as just that, as technology. And you shouldn't be indifferent to what's going on right now. You have to instead be uh, more actively involved in this uh, war life, in these technologies, be par participants of the discussions on how these technologies are going to evolve. Because uh, the uh, uh, demand begets supply. And we need to create this supply because technologies is uh, self perpetuating and it is uh, imposing certain capabilities on the people. And I don't know whether people can design an elephant uh, it has never seen, but nevertheless, this elephant, this proverbial elephant, elephant is now being created, and people just need to understand what are the things that they will entrust to this elephant, in which they won't. But that's from the standpoint of a regular citizen. But of course, for the professional community, it's uh, more important for them to have successful projects, something that will be in demand by the state and by citizens, and will be at the same time competitive on the world markets. And uh, at the government level, I would like to wish us all to find the right balance between all of the stakeholders and to uh, take leading positions on the world level, especially when it comes to the export of Russian technologies that are AI-based. Thank you very much.